Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of White Pod, the online community for e-commerce entrepreneurs and business owners. Today, we have the co-founder of Breaking Free Industries, and his name is Josh Nowak. Josh, thank you for joining us today. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor and privilege to be here. It's a beautiful morning here in Southern California. Fantastic. Um, why don't we just jump right in? And uh, if you don't mind, can you just share a little bit of your background so our viewers can know you better? Sure. So I am a formerly incarcerated person, and we'll get to more of that in just a second. Uh, by background, uh, I have an MBA, CPA, all that sort of stuff. Um, wrote up the chain of command within the, the financial family of, uh, of jobs, was a CFO, was a practicing CPA for a bit. I made some terrible choices that got me incarcerated. Uh, and then when I got out, life didn't get exactly too much better. I was served divorce papers and had open heart surgery. And then when I was recovering from open heart surgery, I'm like, what am I going to do? How do I be relevant in this world again? At some point, I knew I'd get a job where someone would hire me. But finding a job post-incarceration was pretty challenging because on one side, um, People at like the low end of the spectrum, so to speak, uh, minimum wage jobs, like people at Target would look at me saying, what are you doing here? Who are you? Um, and then at the higher end of things where my job would typically put me at, I like you, you're a good guy. I believe that you won't steal again, but there's no way in heck my board of directors will let me hire you. It's too much of a risk. So I eventually found my way to see Father Greg Boyle at Homeboy Industries and started becoming intrigued by the social enterprises that he has. I'm like, you know what, why don't we create something a little similar to this, but let's do it for profit. I'm not interested in helping everybody in the world. I just want to help those that want to help themselves. And let's create a business around second chances. Because if you don't want to hire me, what if we hire everybody that needs a second chance? This way, it's not personal to me. And let's make the world a slightly better place. But I don't want to get involved in the advocacy world. I don't care what's going on in Sacramento or in Washington. Let me just work in my own community and have one person that was on the streets, me, and then maybe another person that was on the streets. And let's go create a job and let's just do something. And then after going through a bunch of different uh, business ideas, I settled on shirts because it's a, a pretty low capital requirement to get started. Doesn't take a whole lot of brain power to get moving. And um, you can start you can start it pretty easily as well as everyone buys a shirt. It's a nominal way to, to feel good about a purchase when you're helping somebody else without getting your hands too dirty. For example, if you're on the streets and you see somebody homeless on the streets, you're not giving the person 20 bucks. But if you're a business owner and you need t-shirts, would you buy shirts for me knowing what I'm going to do with that money? Probably, yeah. And that's how I've been building my business, both on a B2B world where I'm selling custom printing services to the community, as well as our retail brands that we sell off our website. Right. So I read on your website where you believe that most people are good and that sort of ties into what you just said, you know, so it's going to resonate with people and they're going to want to do business with you. And I also hold that belief that most people are good and they want to, you know, do well for other people. And I, that's especially true, I think, in the um, entrepreneurial community. You know, people are always willing to help each other. And if you reach it, reach out you can get support and you can get advice um, anytime. Um, now, it mentions on your website that you're more than just a t-shirt company. Uh, can you expand a little more on that? Yeah, I mean, quite frankly, we're in the second chances business that happens to operate in the apparel space. So I'm an accountant. I've only worn two colors to work for many, many, for most of my career. <laughs> I'm not, have no business personally being in fashion. I'm not an artist. So it's like, we're in the t-shirt space because of the economics of how we can make things work. Not necessarily about, oh, wow, I've got a brand that just really is just amazing. We're going to be the next Nike. We're going to be the next Gap. We're going to be the next you know powerhouse brand. And you know if you look in the apparel space, there's all these apparel companies that are out there, which is great. Um, I'm not that inspired in that way. Like I'm not that passionate about our own branding, so to speak, at least to start. So for me, it's more about how do we create second chances and how do we create opportunities for those really needing that second chance 
so that we can advance that social cause. So it's, yeah, on the one side, we're a t-shirt company, uh, you know, we print shirts, cool. And, you know, we'll print shirts, we'll embroider shirts, shorts, hats, whatever it is. Other than human beings, if there's ink or a stitch involved, we'll, we'll do it. Um, it's more a matter of beyond that, we are much more than just putting ink and stitches on shirts. It's more a matter of how do we kind of make our community a slightly better place by taking people who really need that second chance and getting them a job. Sensational. So, you know, uh, a lot of people actually think that it's really easy to start an e-commerce business. You just get some stock, take a few pictures, put it on a website and you're making sales. But we know it's not that simple. Can you share some of the challenges that you faced and how you overcame them? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are many people out there that just think, hey, wow, I, I want to do a T-shirt line. And it's easy enough to get started. Again, not that many hurdles to get started. Uh, you, you know, a couple hundred dollars gets you uh, your first rounds of inventory. Uh, Shopify is easy enough. They make it really easy. Uh, Squarespace, it's free. Shopify, you can get some really cheap plans to get going here. And yeah, there are applications out there that allow you to get some stock photographs and, and all that. You can upload your PNG image and you can get any number of amazing things, which is helpful. It saves you money on getting models and all that great stuff. Cool. Now to actually make a buck at this, because the, the online marketing firms such as Google, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, they are designed to raise money and sell you advertising space. They are not necessarily designed to uh, make you money. They are designed to get clicks for you. And when they get a click, they get money and you pay them. Once they get to your website, then it's on you to see what, what happens. So I think challenge number one for an e-commerce company is a quite frankly, actually getting started. Hey, I've got this idea. I've got, I've got a domain registration. Well, that's great. Did you do anything with it? No, but I've got this really great domain. Okay, now what? So there's, I think a lot of folks in the entrepreneurial world never get started. So the first challenge is, well, you got to start. Then once you start, then it's like, okay, well, now you have your brand, how are you going to go about getting there? And there's a couple of different pathways to take. Ours was slightly less conventional. About 95% of our revenue comes from B2B connections that don't happen through the website. Our website is a glorified uh, showcase of what we can do so that when I'm having conversations with schools and business owners and whatnot, they're able to look at our apparel and saying, oh, wow, that looks pretty cool. Can we, do, can we use that shirt on with this design and all that? Our biggest opportunity is to start leveraging the internet and leveraging SEO and leveraging pay-per-click on a much more meaningful way so that we can drive in sales that don't involve me, my sales team and whatnot. But that yeah. said, we've had a, a pretty level, a high level of success by working within our community, talking to community leaders, talking to business owners saying, hey, this is our mission. This is what we want to do. Buy a shirt from us, please. And fortunately for us, that has happened. And so if we take this back to an e-commerce company, a lot of folks think that, hey, I'm just going to put up a website and people are just going to come. That's not happening. Everything that inv to drive traffic involves work. It means going out to podcasts, getting influencers on board, getting noticed and driving traffic. It's a very crowded space, no matter what business you have. I don't care if it's an apparel space, if it's an accounting firm. Yeah, there's a level of complacency that exists in any industry. So for example, if I look at my com competition on the screen printing side, the B2B screen printing side, most websites are terrible and nobody does anything in terms of marketing. They have their five to 10 clients for whom they print. If someone walks off the street, cool. And they're generally pretty happy with their, their income in space like that. Anything I do above that, I can probably eat their lunch. On the retail side, it is insanely competitive, insanely competitive. Right. So how do I get the breaking free brand to stand out apart from the thousands of other folks that are buying for your dollar? Well, it's a matter of SEO. It's getting on podcasts such as yours. It's going on to Instagram and posting pictures of our apparel. It's getting out to events and working out with a local community. It's not necessarily about how do you be different. It's all about how you execute better. My example that I love to cite is that you know Microsoft, for all intents and purposes, is a great copycat marketing organization. They really didn't have too many original thoughts of their own. They copied whatever anyone else was doing it. And they flawlessly copied it and executed on their marketing strategies. To this day, I wish I still had WordPerfect and Lotus One Two Three. 
they were better problems. <laughs> Good old Lotus one, two, three. I remember that. But one we got forced into the office environment and now we're in sheets. But yeah. it's like, you know, are, are the products that we have around us, are they truly the best? Or are they just really well executed marketing strategies? So you can have a great product, you can have a great idea, but you got to execute. And execution means going all down these different channels. How do you brand yourself? How do you get your word out to the street? How do you start talking about your product to anyone and anyone who will listen? And how do you talk to people who even won't listen? And just continuing to go on and shamelessly put forth your ideas to pretty much any willing party. And then that's how you start achieving a level of success. Well said. So um, how, how much SEO are you doing? I mean, I, you have really cool t-shirts and really cool hoodies. They might be, you know, some of the coolest I've seen, but that doesn't help unless you're, you know, people know about them. So how exactly are you getting people on the website right now? Admittedly, we could do a better job. We've got some pay-per-click campaigns that are out there. We're working on some SEO. Um, it's still a, you know, if I think about my day job, there's 24 hours in a day and there's only so much I can dedicate towards different elements to it. So there are a couple of our products that actually do really well and just have really good organic SEO. It's all by happenstance. I don't know how it happens. So, you know, part yeah. of our goal in 2023 is to really become intentional about how do we leverage the internet property on its own to drive in not just the retail brands and the retail hoodies, but to really drive in the B2B transactions and getting local businesses in our community. Again, during COVID, no one was getting together, right? Yeah. Now that we finally have events, people are back in the office. There's a reason to buy a shirt. How do I get in front of local <laughs> business owners that want to buy shirts? We, ha we have to wear pants now, I guess. Uh, yes, we do have to wear <laughs> pants. Uh, uh, you, you can't just get away with just wearing a nice shirt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but now that we're getting back together, there are events that are happening. And how do we get to be that provider yeah. of choice for that apparel? And Absolutely. the cool part is that basically, I don't know. I don't know what the statistic is, but almost every business owner at some point during the year will have a, a reason to buy shirts, whether or not they do or don't because of their budget concerns, neither here nor there. Nonprofits are great buyers of shirts. They usually, they'll have an event multiple times a year and they yeah. buy shirts like crazy. Um, hey, we're having a softball game. Let's get some shirts for it. Hey, we're having this fundraiser. Let's get some shirts for for a uh, golf um, tournament. <laughs> that's right for a golf tournament we uh there's for veterans day we supported this one veterans organization that's brand new it was their kickoff event we got them a bunch of shirts that they're using you know they're selling shirts for a hundred dollars each so that they obviously you're not buying a hundred dollar t-shirt you're spending a hundred dollars to donate to this sure. organization you yeah shirt. you understand what it is yeah sure right and so for them it becomes uh for each of our customers, it's a custom conversation about why are you buying your shirts and who's it for? Most of my competition will talk about price. Hey, I can get you in a shirt for $3.99. Okay, great. For this veterans organization, getting made in the USA is really, really important. So yeah. no one, if you ever want to piss somebody off, go to a veteran with a patriotic shirt and show them the made in China label. Now, I'm not saying this as a partisan statement. I'm not saying this as a Democrat or as a Republican or as an independent. But generally speaking, if you go to somebody who has served, I don't care what political party they are, and you show them that shirt with the patriotic flag on that, right. and it says made in somewhere else other than the USA, yep. you'll yeah. get that in the, that's right, that, that exact face. So true. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's common sense. You have to know your market, know your audience, who you're talking right. to. Yeah. And, and in a similar vein, when I'm talking to, say, women's-led organizations, their number one complaint is that unisex shirts don't fit them right. Well, duh, they're designed around male bodies. Yeah. So we work extensively with our suppliers to make sure that we have form-fitting shirts that are flattering both for men and women. And if we need to, hey, you know what, we're going to go half, half, half our unisex shirts, half our women's form-fitting women's form shirts, let's do that. And yeah. really get into who's wearing it and why. So that if you're just really wanting to do a one-day promo to see everybody wear a teal shirt because you have a teal event, cool. We can accommodate that budget and accommodate yeah. that price point. But if you're a business owner and you want to make sure that people are 
wearing those shirts day to day and they really like the look and feel of the shirt and it happens to promote your brand, well, let's create, let's get some shirts for you that wear well, that speak to your brand, that when they look at the label, hey, wow, this makes a whole lot of sense. It's made in the USA. We're made in the USA company, so on and so forth. Like where the, the message that you're sending through the apparel is consistent with your brand values and who's wearing them. Right. So it's taking a, it's a deeper way of looking at it because all too often, especially when we go to e-commerce is that we're looking at price. And then you look at that one guy who's selling a, a hoodie for $150 or a t-shirt for $75. You're like, well, I know the blank, the blank costs four bucks. How are you justifying a $75 price point? Well, it's the story that you create around that shirt. That's why when you go even to even you go to Walmart, you can spend seven, eight dollars on a shirt that would otherwise cost you three. You can go to the the Hanes aisle in any in any store, get a plain white t-shirt for whatever dollars, you know, three dollars, two dollars. But yeah. we'll spend twenty, thirty dollars for a shirt that has a, a message on it that we feel good about. And my job is to find the people that want to spend twenty, thirty dollars and find the message that they want on their shirt, be it a business owner, be it an individual. Um, be it someone who's socially justice oriented or not, find a message that works for them, sell them a shirt, and then ideally sell them a thousand more. Absolutely. Or else let them put their own message on their shirt, which you also do, I see. Yep. Which is Absolutely. really cool. So would you, who are your customers? What would you say is your core market, really? The core market that we have are small business owners that are typically buying shirts between, say, 50 and 500 pieces. That's the typical core market. And the subset under that are people that are sensitive to the made in the USA uh, matter. Because again, a lot of my competition is like, hey, we compete on price and made in the USA is not, uh, for the most part, that's not a price leading conversation. So we sell a lot based upon value about how you're going to feel in your shirt and selling not just a t-shirt. Even if it's not made in the USA, the, the suppliers that we use that are foreign content We make sure that they're not engaging in sweatshops, that they're responsibly sourced, that the cotton is sustainable, that their employment practices, even when they're global, are sustainable. As a second chance organization, I can't in good consciousness sell shirts where I know very well that they're using child traffic labor. Can't do it. Like how how tone deaf can we be if I'm basically selling shirts where the, the ethical pattern of my supplier is a little bit suspect? Yeah, like you want to give second chances to people, but the people making the t-shirts don't even get a first chance. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> so that's not equitable. Okay, that's commendable. Great to hear that. What are your best selling products, Josh? The number one shirt that we sell the most of would be the Bell on Canvas Straight Tee, which is uh, a t-shirt that happens to be made uh, using Indian cotton stitched in Nicaragua, cut, sewn and di- uh, cut and dyed here in Los Angeles. It is a, a slightly premium shirt. We sell probably 60 to 70% of what we print, be it for our own purposes or somebody else's, is that blank. Yeah. So that would be the, whether on the B2B, B2C side, that's the number one shirt that we sell. It does a pretty good job of laying well on women. And as a guy, people are like, oh, wow, that's a really soft shirt. So cool. again, it's coming back to... Um, <laughs> You can buy any number of shirts. How do you feel on it? And it's just, it's kind of interesting to have guys geek out on that sort of stuff. Like normally you would expect the women to be like, oh, wow, it's so soft. When the guys come around and say, wow, that's a really soft shirt. I could, I could put a blazer on this and I could go out on a Saturday night. Can confirm. I'll testify to that. I need a soft, nice t-shirt. You want to be comfortable, man. Guys want to be comfortable. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And so it's interesting that, you know, you, you've got some of the shirts that are more open yarn based where it's a rougher feel. And that makes sense for industrial sort of stuff. If you're out in the landscaping business or if you're in construction, you want something that, you know, if you get a, a little bit of sawdust that's flying up at you, that it's not going to, you're not going to feel it. So having something that's a midweight sure. or a heavyweight shirt. Yeah, we'll do some of that. But the number one thing that we sell is that Bell and Canvas 3001 blank and we sell tons of them. All right. And uh, finally, Josh, do you have any pearls of wisdom that you'd like to share with entrepreneurs who are just getting started in the econ game? Uh, Absolutely. First is take that next step. Actually, I've got a couple of pearls of wisdom. One is do three things every day to advance your business. It could be very easy to just 
okay, I got my domain registration, I've got my website, and I'm not doing anything on it today. Do three things every day that make sense. Uh, that could mean engage an SEO provider. That could mean uh, change the colors of your scheme. It could mean do an Instagram post, but do three things every day. And at the end of the week, you'll have 21 things that you would have done to advance your business. Make three sales calls, make three, anything, just have momentum because momentum gets momentum and you typically won't just start stop at three. That's number one. And number two, and you hit the nail on the head, ask for help. If you don't know what you're doing, more likely than not, in some form, some community, someone will be only too happy to say the answer is X. Now, mind you, when you ask for advice, you kind of sometimes can get what you pay for. But then in that case, you ask five different people and four out of those five people are more or less going to say the same thing. Hey, this is what you need to do. Sure. You're going to have one person who's not particularly successful send you down a rabbit hole that is going to make any sense. Consider the source, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And it's not to say that you have to find somebody who's uber successful to ask, you know, uh, I used to work for a company and the CEO was very profound about saying that she learned more from her failures than she did from her successes. So finding somebody who didn't do so well, isn't necessarily a bad person to ask, but definitely consider your source. Ask a few people, Hey, how did you overcome this? How did you right. overcome that? And you know, I'm just laughing because you just reminded me of one of my favorite phrases. Like, yeah, we learn a lot from our failures, but it's a lot more fun to learn from our successes, isn't it? It's yeah, surprising absolutely. how many people don't learn from their successes. Like, you know, like it works out for them and they don't even know why. So you always should go back and find out how did it happen when you get a good result. Sorry yeah, to absolutely. cut in there, but that's just- No, 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 it's, you're spot on. It's all good. But yeah, just shamelessly ask for that help. And then yeah. the last thing is shamelessly ask for the sale. Yeah. What's the worst that happens? You know, when I was in my tax business, when I first got started- I asked every single person if I can help them with their taxes. I was at a restaurant, I'd ask the waitress. I was at a restaurant, I'd ask the owner. Like when it comes to promoting your e-commerce business, we get used to the idea of saying that we're hiding behind the computer and we lose sight that there are actually people that make those purchasing decisions. Yeah. You never, like the, the fault in that is that you underestimate the value of that human interaction. Like mm. ultimately I'm on this podcast, two people are having a conversation about e-commerce. We forget the notion that e-commerce is ultimately driven by connecting two people together. It's not just computers that are, are just doing the work in the back end. Yeah, there's some of that. But if you are trying to establish an apparel brand, if you're trying to do drop shipping, whatever it is in the e-commerce space that you're looking to do, your goal, your mission is to try and find somebody else, another human being to buy, make that purchasing decision because no one's buying your stuff automatically. Ultimately, somebody at another computer or another mobile device is hitting the buy button. That's a human being. You want to connect. You want to have a level of connection to that person who's ultimately buying that product. Yeah. Find a way to make that happen. And that could mean go to your local, local chamber of commerce. That could mean going, getting involved in your local community. That could be getting involved with trade organizations. Talk to your competition. The world is plenty big that you could talk to your competition. Hey, you know what? They don't do exactly what I do. So we can, I can handle the customers in this space. They can handle the customers in that space. Now you know a little bit better. And then, you know, excess capacity. Hey, do you have job, time to do this job? You never know where that is going to lead. And yeah, like just don't worry so much about, well, gee, if I talk to this person, it's a sign of weakness. Heck no, it's a sign of strength. Yeah, don't ask, don't get. And uh, I think you're right. You know, people have to get outside of their comfort zone. That's where... Everything happens, as we know, right? And a lot of people are uncomfortable asking for business um, and they have illogical fears. And once they get over that and they realize that the sky's not going to fall if they get a no and then they become comfortable with it, that's when they start achieving success. Is what I've Absolutely. Seen. All right, good stuff. Josh, thank you very much. I think our you, audience is going to appreciate this a lot. Great interview. Real pleasure meeting you and speaking with you today. And I wish you all the continued uh, success in the world. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Mark. All right. Thanks, Josh. Take care.